a couple of terms that are thrown around a lot are public clouds, private clouds, and now, of course, because we have those two, we have to have hybrid. Um, the public cloud is a shared resource multi-tenant, which means there are multiple clients running on a given set of hardware. And we've typically seen this in the old days where you might host your website at a provider, and because of the virtual host, you might have four or five different clients' websites running on one piece of hardware. It's the same type of resource here, um, usually off-premise, which means, again, somewhere other than where you are at the time. Private clouds, resources are dedicated to you. So you're paying dedicated money, which means, of course, it's more expensive because the hardware is dedicated to you. You're not sharing it with other vendors. And it can be on-premise or off-premise. So a lot of clients today are starting with the private cloud, and then as they gain more acceptance and more of their users become comfortable, they're either moving to a public cloud or this is actually probably one of the largest, fastest growing segments of the cloud environment, which is the hybrid. So you've got local servers dedicated or maybe even in the cloud, but then as you're trying new applications, you're testing new versions, you can spin that out to the public cloud and then only pay as you go. So it's cheaper as you roll out new applications in the hybrid world um, instead of having to buy dedicated time here in the private world. Um, no offense to Dan, please ask questions because if you're like me, I can't remember a question more than one slide. So jump in with questions anytime. Um, a couple slides on vendors because I think it's important to know who's out there right now. Um, we have Amazon, of course. Amazon is an infrastructure as a service. And as we talked about, they have data centers, which they call regions. So Virginia, Northern California, Ireland, Singapore, and Tokyo. That's the clusters of where this cloud comes from. Within each region, we divide that into availability zones, which allows me the concept of disaster recovery. So I can put my application, I can actually run it in Virginia and Singapore. So I can have it sitting in two places running at the same time. That's going to cost some amount of money. If I don't have that much money, I can actually run two instances in Virginia, but in different availability zones. But they're still in Virginia. So if Virginia is hit by a massive storm, I might still lose my application. So if I need true redundancy, I'm going to pick two different data center regions to house my application. And then recently, because the government said, we want to run our applications in the cloud, but we can't allow foreign countries to also access it. They came out with this, what they call the GovCloud. It's only accessible by US companies. So the federal government can actually use it now, and it's currently being used by NASA. So look to see more um, government agencies, things like the um, Veterans Affairs and things like that are going to start moving to that model. They would never do that. We trust them. See, if you're in the United States, we trust you. So, and that's, again, go back to what Dr. Dillon said this morning. You know, you're in the U.S., we trust you. If you're not in the U.S., we don't trust you. So nobody would ever move here just to attack us or use us as a funnel. So, yeah, there's a flaw in that logic, certainly. Um, I mentioned Azure. Azure is a uh, platform as a service. And there's going to be two different flavors. One is going to be Windows Azure, which is going to be our standard um, server 2008 or 2022, whatever the next one comes out. And then there's going to be SQL Azure, which is going to be basically just SQL Server sitting on a massive data farm, as many disks as you want to pay for. So you're going to have a large SAN background with um, SQL sitting up front. So if you have large data storage needs in the cloud and you don't want to manage that database and all that back-end storage, you can subscribe to Windows SQL Azure. Um, OpenStack, again, is an infrastructure as a service, open source. Um, these are just four of over well over 100 companies that are participating. So we have Rackspace, Dell, Citrix, Cisco, some of the major players in the market. And again, this is something you can go download for free. It's not something you're going to download and implement overnight. There are many large manuals that go with this, and it's a lot of do-it-yourself, build-it-yourself. 
So if you're a tinkerer and you don't mind compiling and getting your hands dirty in some of the low-level software, right now it's free. Just like anything else, just like when the Linux operating systems came out, very much hands-on. And then GUI and then um, scripts. So over time, this is going to become more of a commercial-looking application. Uh, again, Dell is also coming out with its own infrastructure as a service. Um, no shock at the time, they built it on VMware technology. So um, they will be adding support for Azure and OpenStack, and they have the three models that are traditionally looked at as far as cloud, pay-as-you-go, reserved, and dedicated. Um, and then I couldn't leave out Apple, which is a software as a service, um, stores music, photos, applications, again, as Dr. Dillon was talking about this morning. Um, all that stuff can go up to the cloud. Anybody heard the term SLA? Anybody like writing them or working with a vendor to develop them? When you get into the cloud world, they become extremely important. Um, and I try to list some of the things that a good SLA document will have. Response times um, are simple. You know, that's, that's the traditional SLA. In the old days, we had them with our um, circuit providers. You know, we will only accept a certain number of minutes per month or per year outage. Or an SLA in the old days may have been, if we call you, you must call us back within two hours or escalate it within a certain number of hours. Those are kind of the old school SLAs. In the cloud world, the things that we care about are the first probably four or five bullet points. Um, data corruption, you know, their servers crash just like our servers do. Their disk drives fail just like ours do. They have incompetent people working there like none of us do, but other companies do. And they put a patch and something goes away. Well, what happens when that happens to your data? You can't drive there and go inside and fix it. You have to depend on them. And your only fallback is the SLA. Service degradation. Uh, outage is simple. Everybody understands an outage. You know, it's, it's unavailable. But what happens if you have service degradation? What happens if the application that's sitting on the same server as yours is under a denial of service attack? You're not the victim or the intended victim, but your, your server is unavailable because their server is being attacked. What do you do? How do you get compensated for that? How do you maybe prevent that or stop them from doing it the second time. Um, I'll give you a real world example. Um, you may or may not know, last weekend the Chesterfield Federal Credit Union website went off for 24 hours. What happened? Their hosting provider was attacked. Their website was compromised. So it wasn't technically their fault, but they were out of business for 24 hours. So for that thought of, well, I'll just push it out to the cloud or I'll push it out to a hosting provider and it's their responsibility, you can take that attitude if you want, but what happens when they go down or they're, for whatever reason, unavailable and that makes you unavailable? So you got to take that into account. Backup or store issues. You know, it's nice to back up, but can you actually restore? How do you know that your vendors are, A, backing up and, B, periodically testing the restores. They're not unless you make them. They're not just going to voluntarily do it because it's time consuming. The last thing you want is in an emergency situation is to try to do a restore and there's no data. Um, as Dan said, what happens if the company is closed or is sold? I mean, you get a letter that says, you know, within 30 days we've been sold and we're moving to another vendor and they don't like Azure, they like OpenStack and you've got 30 days to change your apps. That could be a problem. Um, and then finally, for some of the folks here, and especially tomorrow, HIPAA. Do you have a business associate agreement in place? Because they now have your data. And if they are breached, you're going to be the one noted in the lawsuit. Yes, you're going to sue them to get some recourse back, but your name is going to be on the lawsuit. If you don't have that business associate agreement, you could be in a lot of trouble. Uh, PCI, anybody take credit cards? Pretty much the known business world. Well, if you're hosting your data or your applications or your infrastructure at a provider, are they compliant? And their first answer is going to be sure, absolutely. 
ask them what it really means, and they're like, well, you know, we have a firewall. We, that's not PCI compliant. So if you're hosting and you're under PCI, you need to make sure that they provide you with documentation that says and guarantees that they are, in fact, compliant. Um, here's one of the things where we're, we're taking the cloud. The, the bad guys now are using the cloud to attack. So they basically, with a credit card and about 50 bucks of time, you know, everybody probably heard about the Sony attack. Well, this is how they did it. They went on, they fired up a bunch of EC2 servers, and basically brought down Sony for how many days? Multiple times. So 100 million Sony customers were affected by that for about $50 worth of credit card time. How much time, how much money? $2.48 an hour. You couldn't possibly re reproduce that in the physical world for anything close to that. Um, anybody know what a GPU is as opposed to a CPU? RTD2 there. A CPU, of course, is a central processing unit. It's what makes the computer work. A GPU is a graphical processing unit. It's what makes the fancy gamers, the, the guys, that, girls that play the video games. Those cards can do password cracking orders of magnitude faster than computers with just normal CPUs. I can rent dual GPUs for $2.10 an hour. What that means in the real world is if I'm running a CPU-based password, password cracking system, I might be able to do 3 million guesses a, a second. With dual GPUs, I can do about 10 billion. So $2.10 an hour, I'm going to get your passwords and I'm going to crack them. I don't care what they are. It really doesn't matter what they are. At that price, for that power, they're gone. And finally, we have actually a new acronym, Exploit as a Service. I was actually shocked. I mean, I've been in this business a long time, and I was shocked. You can now go on the Internet and purchase an exploit. I can pay enough money and say, I want your website taken down between this time and this time. And they'll give you a price, and you pay it, and I can now launch the attack from the Internet using these cloud services. A um, couple things real quick. Cloud apocalypse is a new term. Um, the definition is the point at which everything goes really wrong. How does that happen? Um, uh, Dan mentioned Dropbox. You may or may not know that in June 2011, Dropbox had about four hours of time where all their passwords were basically not needed for about 100 accounts. I could log into that, those 100 accounts with no password. So for those folks that think, you know, I can put my data up on Dropbox and it's 100% secure, not true. And Amazon EC2, I'm not saying these are all, but these are some of the more uh, well-known. July 2008 affected the U.S. and Europe. April 2011 affected sites like Reddit, Foursquare. Three days of outage for some users. So if you have your data and your applications in the cloud, could you stand a three-day outage? August 2011, lightning strike in Dublin, Ireland. Knocked the entire European cloud offline for two days. And your question is, how can a single lightning strike knock the entire cloud down, which is what they do for a living? It happens. Netflix, Quora, and Foursquare. And so Foursquare and Quora are taking a beating every time Amazon goes out. Gmail, just to be fair, the other large provider that we think could never possibly have an outage. Again, these aren't all. These are just some of the more well-known. 2008, July 16th, August 6th, 15 hours, August 11th, 2, August 15th, 24, October 16th, 30. Um, two outages in 2009 and at least two outages in 2011. So just to, again, show you that just because you put the data and the apps in the cloud does not all of a sudden mean that you'll never have an outage and you need to plan for that. In the wrap up, I don't want to discourage you from using cloud. Just go in with your eyes open, know what's there. 
choose the vendor precisely to find the SLA, that's probably the most important thing that you're going to do is this step. Test thoroughly, migrate slowly, watch the metrics, and by the metrics I mean things like response time, um, how does their help desk, how responsive is it, how knowledgeable is it. Most importantly, make sure the users or clients are happy because if they're not, this whole project is going to fail miserably. Routinely test the backup and restore process. <clears throat> Again, don't assume that they are either backing them up or testing them. And of course, any cloud service or cloud uh, application certainly has to be rolled into your disaster recovery and business continuity plan from the two slides before. What happens when Amazon goes away for three hours? Can your business sidestep that problem and continue, or is it simply out of business until Amazon comes back up? That's all I had. Questions?